In today's, uh, in the fast-moving world of AI and machine learning, Chinese and U.S. companies are racing ahead to create industry-dominating businesses that have worldwide ramifications. Currently, Chinese companies are ahead in applied AI, specifically in the areas of facial recognition and natural language processing, while American companies dominate in the basic AI research and platform building. There are plenty that both sides can learn from each other as a source for new ideas and competition, but also for collaboration. Rao Talasila is a seasoned technology leader with a successful track record of delivering commercial software and hardware products at Cisco, IBM, and startups in Seattle, Silicon Valley, and China. He has built, sca built scaled, and operated sizable cross-functional global teams in building products and services in connected consumer devices, IoT, data analytics, and machine learning slash AI. Rao has spent over 15 years in China in startups and large Fortune 500 companies. Please welcome Rao Telesila. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Chung Wu Hao. Um, I'm going to um, have the talk in uh, three, uh, 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 three topics. I'm going to have three, uh, three subtopics. One is I'm going to first cover, uh, just give my personal context, and uh, we're going to go over the uh, industry context for AI. And the third is uh, where we're going to have a Q&A session. So this is how um, I'm, um, I'm planning. Uh, just to give my personal context um, is that um, if I split my life into three equal periods, um, the first period I spent in India, um, and then the second period I spent in the US, um, and the third period was in China, and now I'm back in the US. Uh, that has been my you know, three periods. And uh, interestingly enough, my uh, professional career has been mostly in uh, uh, US and China where um, I worked in uh, startups in uh, Silicon Valley, Seattle, uh, and also in China, and also worked in big companies such as uh, uh, Cisco, IBM, again, both in uh, China and, uh, and, and US. So I've been fortunate to have that opportunity of being on the front lines of, of the tech industry, both in, this, uh, in uh, both these amazing geographies, and being able to uh, you know, build engineering teams, build products, and, uh, uh, and build businesses. And hopefully through this talk, um, I, I, uh, so I want to share my experiences through this, uh, through this, uh, 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 through this uh, subject on this, uh, on this AI subject. Um, so anyway, now uh, before I move to the industry context, I just, uh, I'm just curious, how many of you have been to China? Just if you could raise your hand. A little bit higher, please. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, how many of you have spent more than a year in China? A few. And um, how many of you are uh, AI machine learning practitioners right now? Oh, good, good. <laughs> All right, um, that's good. Um, so anyway, we will uh, start the uh, the uh, the phase of the industry um, industry context. So before I move, I just um, I um, I, um, I want to get some uh, understanding from the audience. Uh, this is a, a statement, and I just want to have a, a simple raise of hands on this uh, statement, whether it's a myth or a fact. The uh, statement I'm making is a U U.S. published the highest number of uh, AI papers in 2018. I just uh, uh, raise of hands who, who think it's a myth. Raise of hands who think it's a fact. OK. Um, it's a myth. So uh, actually, China uh, published um, twice the n number of uh, papers in AI. Uh, than the, the U.S. Second one, 
China's uh, GDP spending on healthcare is, is about half of the US. How many of you think it's a met? How many of how many of you think it's a fact? Oh, good. Uh, the, uh, the answer is that it's closer to the fact. Actually, uh, it's one third of uh, the U.S. U.S. spends around 18 percent of its GDP on healthcare, and China is about 6.5 percent. And again, I will actually touch about this uh, subject at the um, in, in the later on slides. So, um, so uh, let's go through some comparative AI development between China and the U.S. Um, um, as the first uh, as a statement I made, China is actually publishing more AI papers uh, than, uh, than, than China. If you look at the graph on uh, your left, right, this shows the cumulative number of, uh, number of uh, cited uh, AI publications uh, from different geographies. So this is for the 22 years from 1996 to 2018. Um, so as you can see, China kind of exceeds uh, U.S. and any other, any other geography with regards to the uh, cumulative number of papers published for the 22 uh, years in that period. But I have to say that that figure, um, most of the papers have been published the last five years. That has been why, why uh, China is able to uh, show that uh, show that figure, and again, China is able to publish a lot of papers, but but the quality of it is not up to up to what you expect from, for example, U.S. On the uh, right lower, there's another graph that shows um, a graph that shows what we call a hedge index. The hedge index it's a metric that uh, denotes the productivity and the citation impact of the AI papers, right? So as you could see, the, uh, uh, even though uh, US publishes uh, less number of papers than uh, China, but its, but its impact is uh, three times that of, 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 uh, of China. So the fact of the matter is that uh, US still produces the best quality AI papers. So even though China produces a lot of quantity, right now, the US is producing the best papers. But as you will see in the next few slides, China is, um, is actually catching up on that quality side also. Um, and this again shows the, uh, the trend of the, Chinese, uh, um, of the cited papers for the last, uh, uh, last six years. The tipping point arrived in uh, 2015. And as you could see, 2017 and 2018, it just, it just uh, the gap widened. For folks who follow China, uh, 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 so I was just curious if any of you thought why in 2017 the gap really widened. I'm just curious, uh, anyone has? A guess? Go ahead. Exactly, exactly. So in China in 2017, in the first quarter, the Chinese government actually released a, a thing called Artificial Intelligent uh, Development Plan, also called AIDP. So as per the AIDP, the Chinese government put in explicit goals on how they want to uh, grow that industry and dominate that industry. As per this goal, they set a uh, goal of the AI industry being able to bring revenues of $150 billion by 2030. And they have specific goals on what they want to achieve in 2020, 2025. So they made these explicit goals, and that's why you see the number of AI papers is just stuck ballooning from, uh, from 2017. And um, uh, uh, moving on to the industry, how that, how that trend 
industry is able, uh, you can see it in the industry is the graph on the left, it shows the number of equity deals in different geographies. Um, as you could see, the number of equity deals related to AI has been actually doubling every year since 2014. And the graph on your right side that shows the absolute uh, dollars, investment dollars that went into those AI deals. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I can't read the chat. Can you explain them to us? Yeah, sure. This is, uh, you mean this one? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that shows actually on the one on uh, uh, your left, that shows the equity deal share for the years 2014 to 2018. One second. And, uh, and on your right is the equity funding share for the year 2014 to 2018. Sorry, go ahead. I hope I'm not the only one uh, wondering that. What is an equity deal? So equity deal is like um, a, uh, a, VC, a VC firm, for example, uh, making an investment in an, uh, in an AI firm. Or one, um, uh, one company acquiring another AI company uh, for equity. Equity means stock. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you again, but I can't read the legends. So if you want oh, okay. To sorry. Uh, the right. legends are uh, the one in the orange is uh, the U.S. deal share. The one in dark blue is the China deal share, and the one in uh, lighter blue is the uh, um, um, is the other countries. So on the left side, as you could see, the dark blue part is actually doubling almost every year. That shows the number of uh, um, equity deals, meaning that um, the deals that involve AI startups are actually doubling the, the, uh, the absolute numbers. And the graph on uh, your right, that's the, uh, that's the absolute funding amount, right? So as you could uh, see, the, uh, the uh, funding is kind of relatively sort of, uh, uh, you know, in the same figure, but uh, suddenly in 2017, this is like a big jump. And actually in 2017, the amount of funding that went into AI startups in China exceeded uh, the US. And again, I'll just, I was just curious if uh, the audience have any, uh, any guess on what happened in 2017, uh, other than that, that, that you mentioned. Uh, uh. Didn't the government start pumping more money themselves? Like um, related to, uh, yeah, I, I can explain. It's, it's, it's actually um, the VC firms started really f uh, funding uh, mega deals. So in uh, 2017, there was uh, about $4.9 billion went into some 200 odd deals, out of which $4 billion just went to four companies. And uh, a company called uh, ByteDance, I don't know if you heard of a, a, of a um, app people use uh, called TikTok. TikTok. So ByteDance is a company that actually produces a, a, a TikTok. So in 2017, a startup received $3 billion in funding. Imagine, this is just this is this obscene amount of money. So anyway, in 2017, it just, it, it just went out of control. And again, that has to be seen in light with the Chinese government saying that, hey, um, we're going to do some big stuff in, in, um, in this AI space. So the industry just also went out of control, and they just splurged that money, uh, money out there. Now, this actually uh, shows, um, again, these uh, uh, AI metrics for the years between 2017 and 2018. Uh, as you could see on the, in the first row, the China and the US funding is almost closed, right? So Chinese uh, funding levels came almost as close to the US for uh, these two years, right? And if you look at the two columns of the, the green one, we could actually dig deeper into that part. The third row, which is uh, uh, number of acquisitions of AI firms, 
um, in China, there was only nine acquisitions for these two years versus 526 in the US. Right? You could see the, the US just dominates that acquisition, uh, the n n number of companies that, uh, that getting acquired. What this actually shows is how uh, mature that uh, startup ecosystem and the AI, uh, AI field is. Um, and the number of uh, AI startups, again, in China there was 383 versus 1,300, uh, it's about four times. Um, um, and again, if you, uh, you, you, uh, if you look at the last one, highly cited AI patent family. Uh, uh, China had 691, and US has 28,000. It's just, there's not even a comparison, right? Again, so going back to the f figures that I showed, highly cited AI patents, US just leads. I think it has a, uh, very, a very big lead on that. And again, coming back to the last row, that shows the overall score. score. You could see that as an AI competitive score. So as per the score, uh, US is still three times that of China. I mean, when you include the funding, uh, the patents, and how many startups um, are uh, being born in uh, US. U.S. right now, it leads uh, in this AI field. But as, as, I will, as, as we'll see further, China is closing the gap. This is a very interesting uh, metric. This actually shows how many uh, firms are actually have actually adopted AI in their business practices or in their business model, and how many firms are actually piloting, uh, piloting AI. So if you see the uh, figure on the, uh, on the lower side, on the uh, second row, in the 2018, um, about 53% of the Chinese companies are thinking of actually piloting AI. Actually, they're, they're piloting our AI versus only 29% of it. What it actually shows is um, that's just um, the um, eagerness for Chinese industry and the Chinese government to, to embrace AI. Um, so I'll give you a personal um, uh, anecdote. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, uh, I lived in China for actually 15 years. Uh, our son was born in China, uh, so we sent him to a local school in uh, China. And in 2016, he was in, uh, uh, he was in grade three. And he comes home one day and says, Dad, we have to do AI. <laughs> and I asked him, what? Oh, uh, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Why are you telling me we have to do AI? He said, look, my, our school teachers are telling us China is, uh, you know, China has to do big in AI. We all have to do AI. So I asked him, what do you mean? What do you have to do AI? He said, that's what you got to tell me what I need to do to do <laughs> AI. <laughs> so, so what I was saying is that in, for folks who've been, uh, who spent a good amount of time in China, the way the s s uh, system works is that once the central government sets a goal, that goal and the message, it just percolates all the way down to the village, from Beijing to the provincial capital, to the county, to the villages. It just percolates it. And you go anywhere in this uh, chain, people speak the same language. If you go, I mean, if you go and ask anyone, they'll be saying exactly the same thing as my son would be saying, all right? And hopefully, uh, people about know what they need to do in AI other than my son, but it just shows shows how the whole ecosystem, once they focus on a goal, everybody just races to to achieve that goal. So that's why you see the 
the, um, the wild embrace of AI in, in uh, China. Um, and the other interesting um, experience from my personal experience being in China is that the Chinese are very, um, uh, very forward-looking people, right? They want to look forward. Very few people want to look back, right? Um, I'll give you an example. When I moved back uh, uh, to China in 2003, I really wanted to uh, uh, live in an old house, like old house, because I thought old houses are charming, and uh, Shanghai has many old houses. But the lo local Chinese were like wondering, are you crazy? Why do you want to live in an old house? I mean, wh why don't you live on the brand new skyscraper in front? And uh, they just couldn't understand me. And, uh, but only foreigners would kind of understand why anyone wants to, uh, wants to live in an old house. So again, I'm, I'm just giving you the example to say how the Chinese, uh, they don't want to look back. They want to look forward. So if AI is a goal that the government and the industry thinks that they have to, um, the, you know, they have to uh, go after, everybody goes after. That's, that's why I think uh, this, uh, th this figure has to be seen in, uh, in that context. No. Uh, Raul, would some of that be driven by government subsidies too? Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, of course. And um, uh, moving on, this um, shows, uh, uh, so this is a snapshot taken in mid, uh, mid of 2017 that shows the, uh, the uh, number of AI-related uh, startups that are in those various uh, domains. As you could see in the graph here, the healthcare and the autonomous car uh, domain attracts the maximum number of, uh, number of AI startups. So um, there's some very interesting uh, reasons why healthcare actually dominates uh, the area where um, AI startups are just uh, mushrooming. So before I go, I just, just want to uh, see how many of you have you been to a Chinese hospital? No, yes, I love. Um, so for um, uh, uh, folks who haven't been there, I would say is that the Chinese hospitals, any hospital that you go from the central, provincial, the county level hospitals, they are stacked with state-of-the-art uh, hardware. What, what I'm talking about is the CT scanners, uh, the MRI scanners. They're stacked with hardware, but what they lack is uh, properly qualified medical doctors and uh, uh, medical practitioners who can accurately diagnose it. That's a big problem in China. They got the hardware, but they lack that software. So uh, what, it has actually, uh, what is actually resulted is that uh, for the Chinese patients who have critical diseases and they have to uh, get it cured, they usually come to either Shanghai or Beijing, where the top tier hospitals are, uh, are uh, actually located. But the problem for the Chinese government is that they, these two uh, cities cannot handle everyone coming to the city for treatment. So they want to push back that quality health care back to where, uh, where the people are, uh, I mean, back to the county level. Uh, but because of a various, uh, various reasons, the doctors and the medical practitioners are not up to that level. So how do you solve it? So here comes AI. So the Chinese government feels that, hey, um, if you have a good AI model and you give this AI model to a medical doctor or a practitioner and, and, uh, and, and uh, bring this AI model to the county hospital, and at least it can elevate the quality of uh, care of, uh, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in China. And that's a, re a reason why so much of these um, uh, startups are happening in this uh, healthcare sector. Yeah, 
one of the challenges in healthcare in the United States here is uh, protecting data and, and restricting access for certain people around healthcare data and privacy laws and all that. Is there a similar legal equivalent in China, or does the government help um, you know, a lot of these AI companies get access to the data they would need to train their models? Uh, the quick answer is uh, uh, data, lots of data, privacy issue is not that much in the US. I, I can explain further. Next slide. Um, so back to the figure that I mentioned in the second slide, where I said the, uh, the Chinese has spent around 6.5% of the GDP on healthcare, while US spends eight, uh, about 18%. And, uh, and in China, China has four times the population of US. So, and the Chinese doesn't, they don't want to end up spending a significant part of the GDP like the US, uh, you know, going to 18%. So they feel that AI is the answer, right? So if they, if, if they implement this AI schemes properly, they might be able to uh, get better quality of healthcare without spending obscene amount of GDP on healthcare. So that's the impetus behind this. Why there's so many startups in the health uh, in the healthcare sector. Now, um, this is just a, a snapshot. I'm not trying to scare you guys with all the Chinese out here, uh, but this is a snapshot that actually shows how the healthcare ecosystem is actually maturing in AI, in, in, in China. In the center, that, uh, that, they, uh, that we call as the core. In the center is where there are these core AI uh, providers that provide that uh, medical technology, for example, uh, medical imaging or uh, the uh, 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 healthcare uh, management. They provide the core technology, and in the middle layer, uh, these are the companies that are the that are the service providers that would actually take that core technology and package it in, in, into solutions. And in the outer layer is where the end users are, like for example, hospitals, insurance firms, consumers. These are the these are the um, uh, these are the end users. And this is again a snapshot of the core providers. I'm just showing this uh, slides for uh, you to be aware that this, um, this is actually getting uh, to be a very mature ecosystem out here. So these are the companies, for example, in the uh, uh, medical imaging, healthcare assistance, lots and lots of companies in doing it. So now we'll come back to the core topic, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the core question of, um, of this topic, uh, the uh, US versus China uh, in, in, in AI, the strengths and weaknesses. So let's say we have a hypothetical conversation between uh, Sherlock Holmes and, and Dr. Watson. Uh, I hope folks know who they are, right? <laughs> um, so Mr. Uh, 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 Dr. Watson says, uh, Sherlock, how does the U.S. stack against uh, China with regards to AI? And uh, Sh uh, Sherlock says, elementary, my dear. This is just all, all about fundamental versus applied. Right? So what, what, um, what Sherlock meant was that it's all about the fundamental AI versus, uh, versus applied AI. Here's the thing that explains what, uh, what fundamental AI is. Fundamental AI is the, the basic foundation of, of, uh, of AI, the basic algorithm that run the AI engines. Like, for example, for folks who are familiar with AI, the deep learning models, uh, those form the foundation um, of the AI. And the platforms on, um, on which people build applied AI. So the foundation could uh, include this platform such as uh, PyTorch um, and uh, TensorFlow. Again, these are open source platforms. So the US is very good, very strong in uh, this foundational, foundational AI. So if you just uh, look around the world, no one comes even close 
to the, uh, the dominance that the uh, U.S. enjoy in this, in this foundation AI. Now, applied AI is where you take this, uh, this foundational AI and apply it to some real-world problems, like, for example, facial recognition, speech recognition. I think this is where, uh, this is where China really dominates. And again, going back to the question I think one of the audience asked, here, China has an, has an advantage because it has about 850 million mobile users, right? And for, for folks in, who've been to China will all know, uh, Chinese are crazy with the phones, right? And uh, they're just producing lots of data, right? And access to the data, especially the privacy issues, uh, this uh, less stringent. The Chinese are used to the fact that um, I, 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 I mean, actually, how should I say? Um, Chinese are okay for so many cameras on the streets being watched at them, right? No issue at all. I think so, uh, so far. So. Having Chinese firms have access to the data and less stringent privacy requirements, they're able to create this, this, uh, this um, um, applied AI uh, application. They're taking to the next stage, right? So I'll sh show you some few examples where I personally um, experienced those, those, the, uh, the strength of those foundational API. And again, Going back to the uh, uh, key success factors for this foundational AI and, uh, and, the, and, and the applied AI. Why uh, US is uh, dominant in foundational AI is that one is that it's able to attract the best talent from the world. Anywhere from the world, if you want to do AI, people come to the US. Right? Second is that there's a very strong uh, culture of actually open source collaboration. Right, sharing, right? For example, this uh, platform such as uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch, right? It's a very rich community of actually sharing the models, sharing the data. So this is a rich, rich environment. And also, uh, uh, US has a strong uh, legal protection uh, system, right? People, uh, uh, people actually respect it, and uh, folks who create the IP are actually rewarded financially well. And the, and the fourth important thing is that in the US, there's a lot of uh, uh, money that goes into that foundational AP, uh, um, AI startups, right? So, and also they say patience in the US to, to fund it and wait for um, the interesting uh, uh, IP to come out. Now, with regards to China, the strength that come to the applied AI is that, as I was saying, there's a lot of data and less privacy issues. And China has a ultra-capitalistic entrepreneurial culture. It's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll explain to you in, in, the, in, the, in the next slide. And in addition to that is that there's a strong government the governmental support for it. So these are the factors on either side that actually helps them uh, dominate, either in foundational AP, uh, AI or uh, the applied AI. Now again, I, I just want to I just want to leave a food for thought. How will this evolve, say, ten years from now or twenty years from now? So um, I'll go through some applied, uh, <laughs> applied use cases where I can share my personal experiences um, in, uh, in China. Um, so this was in, this was in uh, November 2017. I was in a panel discussion at, this, uh, at a conference organized by a magazine called Eats High. It is the equivalent of sort of equivalent of Fortune magazine in China. So we are on a panel. There were like five or six uh, gentlemen from China. And we were three guys who are non-Chinese, right? 
and we are, we are allowed to talk either in Chinese or English. Um, obviously, we, we spoke three, uh, three guys who spoke in English, and the Chinese they spoke in Chinese. And behind us was there was a huge screen behind it. And as one of the Chinese uh, panelists was speaking in Chinese, uh, uh, you know, behind our screen, you could see um, what he was saying, uh, just uh, showing up in Chinese. And at the bottom half of the sc uh, screen, there was simultaneous translation uh, into English, right? So as a Chinese gentleman speaking, um, uh, so I'm just looking at it. I'm just amazed at the quality of, uh, 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 um, uh, of the translation. And when my turn came, just to trick the, uh, the system, I tried to switch between Chinese and English and see how the <laughs> system performed. <laughs> That's why you could see I'm just looking back and see how it thinks. I was just astounded how good that uh, the translation was. And again, for folks who use Google Translate, right? I mean, people use Google Translate to translate uh, thing. And I've used Google Translate. Google Translate does very well from English to Chinese. No problem. Very good. You ask Google Translate to do Chinese to English, oh, it's terrible. It's lousy. Because Chinese is, uh, Chinese is a very ambiguous language in a sense that um, the meaning of a character would differ based upon the characters before it and what has been said uh, in the sentence before. So your algorithms have to be super smart to figure out what actually that means. But this company called iFlyTech is based in Shenzhen. Uh, they just cracked it. And I, I, I can say uh, this is that with regards to speech recognition, I think this Chinese company and the Chinese industry is, uh, is ahead of the US. Right? I n uh, 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 never thought it, it, uh, um, it could happen, but I was astounded that it was just happening in front of my eyes. <laughs> and um, this is another, um, uh, another example. This is for uh, facial recognition. Uh, it's not that clear. It actually, what it shows is that on the left side of the screen, there's actually <coughs> turnstiles. Like uh, when you go into a stadium, someplace you have a turnstile. But here, in addition to the turnstile, there was a big screen and a camera at you. And uh, on the uh, right side, this is, this is a picture from that uh, tourist location um, where we went. This was in 2018, April, right? So almost a year and a half back. Me and my family, we went uh, for a, a week-long uh, trip um, for a vacation. This is a tier four town, not the snazzy Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen. It's like a town in the middle of, uh, middle of America, equivalent. And then um, this uh, tourist location has uh, maybe 15 to 20 uh, tourist spots, right? And at this location, you go and buy one ticket, right? And you can use that one ticket to go and visit any of the 15 to 20 locations on that day, right? So I went in, and I have the ticket, and my family, each member has a ticket, and you just use the ticket only once when you enter the turnstile, right? Turnstile. Use the ticket, it, uh, it takes a picture of you, who you are, and that's it. After that, you can throw away the ticket. Your face has become the ticket, right? And with that, you could go to any of those 15, 20 locations the whole day, anytime, just in and out. I was just amazed, as, uh, I was just astounded. Uh, so again, the Chinese firms are able to build this because one, they have lots of data and privacy is not an issue. I don't think any Chinese would say, why are you taking the picture? I've never heard of this thing, right? Imagine doing this in, uh, in, the, in, in the US, it's like, oh, okay. So um, anyway, this is, a, this, is a, this is another example where um, I felt that the Chinese, uh, Chinese firms 
are ahead in building really robust AI models where they, uh, uh, they perform very well because of the strength. So this is a company you want? This is a company that you No, no, uh, that's a place. Oh, okay, that's a that's place. Right. So the company that builds this product, how open is what they have? How is it patent protected? Because my, our time in China, we saw a lot of facial recognition companies all being well funded, hundreds of millions for them. So how much are they utilizing the same software, the same ML, and what is their protection? System? Yeah, um, uh, you're actually uh, running ahead of my okay. slides, but I'm just saying is that protection exists technically under the law, but it's wild jungle, I like to explain you. There's no protection. So hmm. it's making it move faster then. You have to move fast. This is how. Yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll explain further on this. But, um, so, yeah, this is my thing about it. Um, so, uh, anyway, I just uh, showed you the two, uh, 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 two use cases where I felt uh, where I felt that the Chinese firms have actually demonstrated their strengths in applied AI. And I uh, just want to go through a day at a Chinese company. Um, I was a co-founder of a, a, in China, I was a co-founder of a, a, um, uh, of a pioneer in doing online um, auto auctions, right? So I've been on the front lines with the Chinese, uh, being in the, in the Chinese ecosystem. So I can share my, my own personal experiences of being a Chinese company. So the uh, next slide shows a, a, uh, is an image that pretty much actually describes what it means to be in a Chinese company. It's a dog eat dog world. <laughs> All right. For folks who've been to China, I don't know, uh, that is uh, uh, 996 mean anything? Have you guys heard anything? Yeah, you know what? Uh, nine out. Nine hours a day, nine, something, nine, and then between six days a week. Yeah, so what it means is that uh, the work schedule is uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Right? And uh, unlike uh, the U.S. where you have a separation of your work and your personal life, mm -hmm. and in China it kind of blends into each other, and you get uh, text messages or WeChat messages as we call it, phone thing, it can come in the night, in the weekend. When you get uh, something related to work, you better, uh, you better respond, right? So that's a kind of, that's a kind of fast moving, uh, doggy dog <laughs> environment is where, uh, especially a Chinese startup uh, is, is operating under. And to answer your question, even though the, in, under law, IP is sort of protected, but in reality, it's, a, it's a, all holds barred, copy and paste, copy and paste. So if, as I, I'm a startup, I invented this AI algorithm or something, um, and uh, um, I, build this, um, I build this product, I'm selling it, don't ever think that it's going to be kept, um, what do you call, uncopied, right? As soon as it finds some uh, success, literally there will be 50 companies trying to do exactly the same thing. 50 companies. So it's a doggy dog world. It's like no mercy, no mercy for the weak and small. So you have to get fast, and you have to get big and deep fast. That's the only way to survive. Right? And um, other interesting thing in a Chinese company is that it's a very entrepreneurial driven uh, uh, sort of culture. Everybody wants to be a boss. Right? So if I'm a founder of a company, right, I have to watch I have to be very careful. Any of my employees <laughs> could just go and uh, s s set up exactly the same company across the street, right? 
So, so in this cutthroat, anything goes environment is where these Chinese companies um, are kind of emerging, right? So I worked in uh, um, I worked in uh, 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 Silicon Valley companies. I worked in Seattle and in Chinese companies. So what the Chinese uh, uh, company founder goes through is, um, I think, when you compare to what a Silicon Valley founder goes through, it's child play. <laughs> this, is, this is child play. So anyway, this is a pretty. Uh, Hmm. Now, the playbook for uh, the U.S. startups. Uh, so as I was saying, again, to recall, uh, U.S. is very strong in foundational AI, and uh, China is actually uh, strong in the, in the applied AI. But uh, there's, there's a, this opportunity to kind of share the learnings from, from both sides. Um, Again, I'm asking the question again. Have you folks heard of what CTC, what CTC stands for? Anyone? Copy to huh? Copy to um, not really. It's called Copy to China. <laughs> it used to be Copy to China, meaning Chinese entrepreneurs just copying everything that happened in the US back to China, right? Now, with all the things that are happening with applied AI, now it's become CFC, copy from China. And you can see that actually Facebook is actually copying some of the innovations that uh, WeChat has made, right? And uh, what actually TikTok is making. Now Facebook is actually copying kind of thing. So anyway, I, I won't use the word copy kind of thing. So what, what I meant is that there's a good opportunity for uh, US companies to see what's going on on the other side of Pacific, right? Because, because of the access to the data and because of the privacy issue, the Chinese companies can do things that a US company can't do it, right? But so they'll get a, um, a view into the future. Oh, this can be possible, this cannot be possible, kind of thing, right? So I think for any uh, US company, I would suggest Take a flight and go to China. Spend a week or two. I guarantee you, it's going to help you. Right. Second thing is actually competition, right? Um, as I was mentioning, healthcare is one area where the Chinese uh, ecosystem is really going after. And again, because of the data issues, privacy issues, I think Chinese are going to come up with. Uh, uh, faster advances with regards to applied AI in uh, uh, medical, especially with regards to uh, medical diagnosis, right? Uh, so um, you, need to keep, uh, you, need, uh, you need to keep a watch on a competition um, of how, how, uh, what's happening. And also, same thing with regards to autonomous cars. And uh, finally, the, uh, the collaboration. I know that the trade war is in full swing, and uh, it may not be uh, not the right time to think of a collaboration. But, uh, but and, and also, the U.S. Uh, companies should not just think that the trade war is gonna um, is gonna protect them, right? Any time this political thing changes, you'll be exposed to the brunt of competition, right? So you better also think of ways you can think of collaborating as, as appropriate. And again, it's very important when you collaborate, think of um, make sure that your IP is protected. And two is find the right partner in China. That's, that's very, very, uh, very, very uh, important. And for folks who are in uh, foreign AI, this is a new, uh, new way of uh, doing AI modeling. It's called federated learning. Federated learning is that uh, use data locally and process locally. So this federated learning will open up the possibilities of actually collaborating uh, between those two countries without uh, data exchanging, um, without data crossing boundaries. So again, I just briefly, uh, uh, briefly touched um, about the 
US versus China with regards to AI. So I just want to summarize that I think still uh, US is still dominant in foundational AI. Uh, China is good in applied AI, but uh, China is closing, closing it up. So, so that's the thing. And uh, happy to answer any questions folks have. Can you cite any U.S. successes in this? Uh, what is it? Can you cite any other United States success in this? Um, I think I would say GE, General Electric, uh, was able to develop some of their medical diagnosis uh, systems in China based upon Chinese data. They partnered with a Chinese company out there. Partner? A partner, yeah. Don't try to do it on your own. What's the uh, vision from the Chinese government towards like the using AI for learning? Uh, is there any or and also um, is implementation of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, if you look at the slides here. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So the question is: Is the Chinese government uh, 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 putting focus uh, towards the education sector and the learning? Yeah. And learning. Is there any implementation? Yes. AI? Yes, I think if you see here, after healthcare and uh, uh, autonomous cars, again, sorry, the, uh, the font is uh, small, then next sector that gets the most amount of startups is education. Learning is very big. So after healthcare, autonomous cars, uh, learning education. So the question is, uh, in this um, uh, lack of this strong IP protection, um, I know, are there any new uh, entrepreneurial activity in new areas, right? So that's the question. I would say is that this has been the situation um, until recently. But now I think even the Chinese government and the Chinese firms are realizing that their IP needs to be protected if anything original has to be done. So that is actually evolving, yeah, um, evolving. But how long it's going to take? Ten years, twenty years? I don't. Know. Have there been any cases where there's been a Chinese company enforcing their IP against another Chinese company on some original research? Uh, so the question is: Are there any cases where a Chinese company going after another Chinese company for IP enforcement? The answer is yes. I've seen these cases, especially in the last two, three years. I've seen actually big companies actually doing it. Big company going after another big company. Uh, I haven't seen small company going after big company, but big, big, it, it, uh, it's, it's happening. Nor? I, I just add to that that, yeah, there's special IP courts in three or four cities now in China, so it's happening. But uh, the, the thing is, the penalties that you get assessed is usually very, very small. Yeah. So you, yeah, you might win, but you don't get much of it. Uh, yeah, by the way, I want to uh, introduce uh, uh, Noor has been in China for more than yeah, like 18 yeah, years. <laughs> 18 years. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Noor is pretty, pretty well versed with, uh, with all, the, all the stuff happening in China. So if the, the competition escalated in the future, do you see the possibility of U.S. government turning some of the open source resources to, into like closed sources? Uh, so the question is, in the future, would the U.S. government uh, shut off access to their open source platforms to the Chinese kind of thing? I'm not, uh, I'm not a representative of the U.S. government, but it looks like uh, there has been some uh, rumblings in that direction. I don't know. Yeah. It, uh, it might happen. But I don't know. 
Yeah. You uh, presented uh, dog it dog uh, kind yeah, of vision uh, about uh, about the companies, and so it seems to me not all, that that not only applies to uh, to uh, the IT uh, field but also to uh, other industries. I remember um, that um, reading, for instance, other uh, commentators uh, talking about the. Uh, Aeronautics in uh, China and say that uh, the standards uh, applied in the field are appalling uh, from a from a American perspective. So in this free for all like uh, perspective, it's I think it's very easy to uh, to have uh, new technologies uh, emerge, but it's also uh, possible to I'm not sure how to phrase it to see crisis or to see uh, problems uh, appear. How much of that uh, do you think happens in the in the world of uh, artificial intelligence? Sorry, if you could rephrase the question again. <laughs> How much of this uh, dog eat dog of this uh, free for all uh, framework for Japanese uh, for uh, Chinese companies is uh, gives rise to uh, to problems, to uh, defectors, defective defective. Uh, uh, Labor rights. Products. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mean the quality of the product? Yes. So the question is with this doggy uh, dog world, uh, how would the quality of the products fare? Yes. Right? Um, see, I would say is that <coughs> the quality of the products coming in this doggy dog world, I agree they won't be as stringent as you find it in uh, the U.S. There's more, uh, um, there's more space given in China for you to experiment and screw ups. It's okay. That's, that's actually, that's the kind of culture. Um, yeah, so the, the, the consumers give the Chinese companies a wide tolerance in, in uh, if there's quality issues. We have time for one more. One more. Um, so I recall you said that the U.S. Uh, focuses more on fundamental AI, right? But seeing this slide, I'm kind of curious. Uh, what are the leading uh, AI startups by industry in the U.S.? Yeah, I think uh, interestingly enough, uh, in in the U.S., I would say uh, healthcare. <laughs> autonomous thing is also a uh, um, area where it attracts a lo lot of startups. But the uh, startups in in the U.S. they are m much more um, uh, diverse, right? There's uh, AI startups for business process automation uh, to improve business productivity, uh, uh, to uh, improve the claims processing better. So it, uh, uh, it's much more diverse in U.S. Only because it has a long, uh, uh, long time to come to this stage. Yeah. But in China, because it just started late, so the uh, uh, the domains where AI is, apl uh, is applied is very stacked against this few few verticals. Yeah. Thank you. On that note, thank you very much. <laughs>